I had the opportunity to work in the Technical Secretariat of the World Commission on Social Dimensions of Globalization. That was constituted by the Director General of the International Labour Organization, Geneva, which is part of the UN system. So I had the, some first-hand experience of witnessing the commission, commissioners debating this topic, including Joseph Stiglitz, and it was chaired by the President of Finland and the Prime Minister of Tanzania, because in the UN system you also have to have a political balancing of uh, formal commissions. Later on, I also worked with a collective of social scientists in the International Panel on Social Progress that was inspired by Professor Amartya Sen, led by Revi Kanbur and uh, two, uh, two others, Nancy Fraser, if some of you are here, sociologists or political sociologists, you might know Nancy Fraser. And there's another philosopher from uh, Switzerland. But there is another intimate reason why I'm talking about it in our own state and to students here. We often think that things happening uh, in the international arena don't really affect us. Uh, you know, we talk about our little problems of students struggling for better hostel facilities and the, you know, all the political parties are fighting at each other, spitting at each other. So these all become our TV news, the anchors get excited, the round tables and, you know, all kinds of things. <laughs> Completely oblivious of what's happening around the world that could really determine our future as a country and as a society. So that's one reason uh, that I, or one main reason that I chose this subject. Why I say emerging international economic order is because with the entry of uh, United States and its allies in NATO, that's about 30 countries. Now the conflict in Ukraine has created an inflection point for the international economic order. That means you reach a stage where you cannot any longer proceed on along the same lines. You either go down or you go up or you deviate to something else. That inflection point is because the United States decided to use not just its military power in assisting Ukraine, but also its economic power. Because much of the international economic system, as in trade, international financial transfers, and international finance, especially through World Bank and IMF, is largely, if not only, controlled by the United States. So they decided to weaponize these economic instruments against Russia. Although Russia is no longer a communist country, there is no ideological difference. So one doesn't really understand what is the enmity against Russia. Is it because of the moral anger that they attacked and subjected Ukraine to a very gruesome war? If that is the case, then it would be very difficult for the United States to take a moral stand having destroyed several countries during the last 50 years, even recently, and won, and won not a single war. They had the power to destruction, power of destruction, but not winning the hearts of the people, including Afghanistan, what happened. This particular weaponization of international economic instruments, which I will come to in, in a more specifically, is not new. Because uh, if, you know, uh, if you are reading newspapers, either in your mobile or in your computer or print, you would know that there are countries like Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, which are already under sanctions. And sanctions to such an extent, they cannot conduct independent financial transactions for their international trade and other purposes. So they have been kept away from the international banking system to the extent Americans are dominating most of the international financial institutions. But these countries are surviving with great difficulty. But what they have done to Russia is much more serious and it is becoming more serious now and which exposed the American economic philosophy and economic system because all that they are doing are against the principles of the free market. In a free market system, in a neoliberal world, you don't interfere in its working in a way that makes it completely 
beyond the purview of the market mechanism. Like capping the oil price. How can you cap somebody else's commodity? If you are a buyer, you can bargain. And buyers can bargain. So market will reach an equilibrium through demand and supply. No, this is like an administrative fiat. That I will not give and I will not allow others to give you more than $60 per barrel. Of course, this is completely gone through to the winds because the Russia said, if you are not going to purchase our uh, oil at the price that we demand, we will not supply you. It's as simple as that. So they also use a non-market principle. So that's what it has come to. But in the process, this action interfering and also Russia has been put out of the international banking uh, mechanism where you have what is called the SIFT. If you want to send money to your cousin or somebody else or buy something else from another country, you can make payment and it goes through a SIFT system, Society for Worldwide International Financial Transfers, uh, which is developed by a uh, collective of uh, bankers but it is all located in the United States it's not owned by the United States government but it is in America so they can say no don't allow this particular country to use this system if you allow then we will withdraw which they cannot afford so they just conform to that so in a way this has also almost put a stop if not a complete full stop, but a considerable decline of what it meant to be globalization. Of course, globalization was never to the advantage or to the liking of the developing countries. It was imposed on them. And since Soviet Union had collapsed in 89, 1990, most developing countries had nowhere else to go when they are in economic trouble. Till then they could use the East, it was then called the Eastern Sphere, Soviet Union and its Comic Con, Eastern Europe and Eurasia. But that option is gone. So many most developing countries willy nilly agreed to the terms and conditions set in the World Trade Organization agreement. Some of them we bargained, got a little bit, some small concessions, but every developing country, uh, you know, entertained. Uh, some kind of complaint, feeling of discrimination, and it still persists. So it was not a perfect one. And also the globalization that was imposed, I call it neoliberal globalization, because the philosophical principle for pushing that agenda, starting with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, it was politically led, was that you should allow the market to function freely and not allow the state to come in and interfere in its mechanism. Of course, it never happened in history like that. There was never a free market, just as there was never a complete state. Wherever a complete state control was experimented upon, like in the United, uh, Soviet Union, it collapsed. Because there are many things which a state cannot really do at the micro level. So it was a total uh, planning by the state. And here what is being advocated is a total freedom for the market. So that binary doesn't exist except in textbooks. But the kind of globalization that the West imposed, because America is in, uh, I wouldn't say Kahoot, but is in strong uh, cooperation with Europe. So the West stands for America, Europe, and the Japanese have no independent, cannot have independent foreign policy or any major international position which is not to the liking of the United States because they, after the Second World War, Japanese constitution was written under American supervision. There are restrictions. The security is the responsibility of the United States overall. Therefore, Japan cannot even uh, have its own nuclear arsenal. So they are under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. So in a way they cannot, so, and they also culturally they have, I don't know how a people and country, um, not many people are asking this question, I often ask how can, when your country was bombed twice, 
and completely destroyed for generations because people, children who were born immediately after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had several deformities. And still you love the country which bombed you out. Uh, maybe that's a way of survival. In the Japanese mind you don't know. Also they have the politics, they cultivated the whole system in such a way that they like to project themselves as part of the West. Although they are geographically East, Asian. They follow, of course, they have certain strong Asian values, sense of hierarchies, superiority, inferiority, deference to elders, and very restrictive freedom for women. We might think that our society is bad enough for much of our women folk. But in Japan, however educated you are, the first job, the first responsibility after you marry is to look after the parents of your husband. It's ingrained in the Japanese. And that's why many of the young Japanese don't like to marry. And if they marry, they don't like to have children. If they have children, by many of my Japanese friends, including some cultural anthropologists, she told me, by 45, 50 we divorce. Because then we can freely travel and go around. Because otherwise you can't do that unless the husband gives you the permission. And these are some hidden features of the Japanese. It may not be as dramatic as I am telling you, but you can imagine in India also, if somebody says you something, we'll say, no, no, it's my house, it's not just like that. You know, I have enough freedom. You may have enough freedom in your house, but not in your society. So that's, <laughs> that's the way it is. So they also become then part of the West for all international politics and economics. They align with the uh, that's why they are a member of the G7, as I've shown here. But this globalization was restricted to free movement of goods, services, part of the services, capital, banks, you know, you know inter-country transfer of finance, but not for technology, not for movement of the people. You can't freely go, if there is a job there, you can't just freely apply a visa and get automatically and go there. No, there are quotas, restrictions. And some countries have freedom, if, uh, if you are an Australian and the UK and America, you can freely go because you are all white. But if you have to go to UK, you have to wait. If you have to go to United States, you have several tests. You have, now the, I think the visit, uh, visa appointment time is 20 months. So that's the kind of uh, globalization that we have. But nevertheless, there was some degree of uh, freedom for developing countries to exploit the opportunities for trade. And if you are good at it, and you can even benefit by it, like the Chinese did, and we did to some extent in the services sector, like the information technology. When America weaponized these financial instruments and other economic instruments against Russia, except the West, G7, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, no developing country supported them. And that's strange. We have more than 200 countries in the United Nations. When the General Assembly took up the Ukraine issue, there was no country which unilaterally supported the United States except the Western Alliance. That sends a very powerful message that we are not happy the way that you are. Because this could be used against anybody in future. So that's why each country is worried about when you are going beyond the conventional conflictual resolution mechanism to weaponizing economic instruments. So we do have now a much more sharper division between the West and the rest. You can say statistically the rest is all the developing countries plus Russia and other transitional economies. But I'm going to redefine the rest because not all the countries are equally powerful to give a counter to the West. Just as the West itself often is symbolized by a smaller number of powerful countries in group of seven, the G7 countries. But they give the leadership to the Western world. So this is the kind of uh, classification I would make. West defined as America, United Kingdom, because now it's out of European Union. Then all the countries in the European Union are 27 countries, small and big. Actually, it doesn't really matter except uh, three or four. There are Europeans here, they may not uh, like me telling this way, but it's true. France, Germany, to some extent Italy, although Italy is now a little weak 
these are the countries which decide the EU's uh, major agenda. Australia, Canada, New Zealand and Japan. So these are around 33 countries. Numerically 33 countries but actually often represented by G7. The rest is now being projected through the combination or collective strength of BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Although there are only five countries against the 33 countries in the West, it's basically between G7 and BRICS 5. But what is interesting, the evolving, that's what I said, emerging international economic order, BRICS is now going to become BRICS plus. Saudi Arabia has already informed the BRICS that they would like to join. That will be a major event in the international economic order for several reasons, including the power of Saudi Arabia lies not in its economy, but in its ability to determine oil prices and the supply of oil, which is very crucial. Just like Russia. Russia could withstand all these uh, sanctions because it is one of the most important members in oil production. Iran is the same, but Iran lacks in military strength to counter any other attack by the United States. So there are something like 11 countries which are closer to the BRICS. And many of them are likely, to, they are already observer status, like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Argentina, Egypt, Turkey, Indonesia. And at least Saudi Arabia and in Egypt and Argentina are likely to become members sooner than later. So I take the rest representing BRICS plus. Because so far BRICS has acted in a manner which is not just in the interest of these five countries, but in the interest of all the developing countries. So it's natural like we had leadership uh, role in the G77 in the 70s and 80s. Now I think the BRICS is taking over that place. Now the, one should not underestimate the power of the West even with all these uh, you know, changes that are taking place. It is evolving and declining for the West. Uh, not in absolute uh, money power, but in relative shares. And, it's, and it still dominates the international financial institutions like IMF and World Bank. If some of you are doing international economics, you know why. They hold the majority uh, voting share there because of their contribution of money. And they are unwilling to change that despite the fact that countries like China, India, Turkey, they are becoming more and more economically significant and give them a proportionate representation in IMF despite the cry for reforming those institutions. International banking system is also largely controlled by uh, the instruments that I talked about uh, by the West. Although India, China and Russia, they have developed their own softwares for bank transfer like UPI in India. As there is a similar one in um, Russia, SIPS I think. Then there is a much more popular one in China where the more than 100 countries are already using it. So China is one of the most emerging powers. But I will not put the whole international economic changing order as one between America versus China. That will be too reductionist and they will lack the credibility if they go it alone. Even for America, they have to have the Europeans with them and the Canadians, if not the Australians and New Zealanders who are far away. Uh, and therefore, I think the grouping is much more significant in the international economic order than just the rise of China as a counter to the United States. Although we should not underestimate the enormous economic power that China has come to have through sheer internal efforts, it's not developed by, you know, by external effort. They may have used external technology, money and all that, but it is there internally driven processes through institutions and structures. In this, of course, we should also note that Asia is the emerging counter uh, to the West. But again, I will not, like many other people have done, just put all my eggs on Asia. Because you just cannot ignore powers like Brazil and Mexico. They are important economies and Brazil has a much more clout in their region than India has in South Asia. And Africa, Two economies, Nigeria and South Africa, are quite important. So I would therefore emphasize the collective power of BRICS Plus as against the portrayal of China as the counter to the West. 
in the international economic order, politics is also important. That is one of the reasons why dollar became the most important currency, not just because the United States was the winner of the world war and the largest economy which was unaffected by directly by any devastation of the world war and they had the biggest uh, or the largest economy but also the uh, strongest military power of course Soviet Union was the counter but then they had carved out a different sphere of influence and that's why we had the cold war for a long time at the moment the strength of the rest that is the BRICS plus is is mainly due to the combination of Russia and China and they have said our alliance is all weather and it's a signal that if necessary we might combine our military strength. But that is not necessary in international politics, postures are enough. So I will later on tell you that the, if you take military strength, very interestingly, the BRICS has almost equal military power like the NATO. I will go back to uh, very quickly to some history of this um, very difficult process of international economic order in the 60s and 70s when developing countries started feeling that they are not getting their due. The space for development through international effort, technology transfer, development finance, access to markets, they were not taking place as envisioned by the United Nations in the 1964 International Development Strategy. There was a demand, collective demand for a new international economic order in favor of the developing countries because they were num numerically the largest group in the United Nations. But they were only numerically the largest, they didn't have the economic clout. But nevertheless, they didn't stop at that. Internationally, that demand continued and they created a South Commission which produced the report and if some of you are interested in knowing the recent history of the demand for a new international economic order by developing countries, you should refer to this report called the Challenge to the South, Report of the South Commission. Interestingly, the South Commission report was prepared by, under the secretaryship of none other than Dr. Manmohan Singh. Immediately after the publication of this report, he came and assumed the finance ministership. And again, unfortunately, much of the policies that he followed were not exactly what he wrote in the South Commission. That was real politic. There were some unintended consequences of this globalization. It did not really work, always work in the interest of the North. Although they thought of the globalization, they have become the sole power. Soviet Union had collapsed. And even political scientists like Francis Fukuyama wrote the end of history. As if there is no more history to be written because the neoliberal economic order and political liberal democracy, these twins, this is going to be the permanent state of affairs of modern world. So what is there in no future history? It's just a continuation. But poor fellow didn't realize that within 20 years all these things changed. And now he must be really worrying that why did I write the way I wrote. And if you look at the writings of a prolific writing by Joseph Stiglitz, and he started with uh, the book Globalization and its Discontents. And you will realize why this globalization did not uh, go the way it did. And he says that one of the reasons for many of the people in the North, that is global North, America, Europe, where middle class, working class are against the globalization because they lost their jobs. Their corporations relocated the investment to China and other countries and service sector, ICT you know, firms to India and other countries. And most of them lost their jobs because it could be produced cheaply here, serviced cheaply here. So it was in the interest of the corporations that the WTO agenda was framed, not in the interest of the people of those countries. Just as the people of the southern countries, global south, that is the developing countries, also get compromised when our countries sign agreements, as in the WTO, in agriculture, for example. We don't have still access to the market, agriculture market in developed countries because they are highly protected. While those countries will tell you, preach you that don't give any more subsidies, that's bad. But they give enormous subsidies to agriculture. The biggest subsidy country for agriculture is Japan, followed by United, uh, EU, EU and the third by United States. So they will have the cake and eat it too. You just have to watch. But in this case, although it produced, in both developing countries and in the north, it produced more inequality. 
the, the main characteristic of the globalization, although it gave a boost to the growth process as a whole because more trade, more technology transfers and if not more jobs because technology was substituting jobs. So it's a jobless growth story, not just in India, in most other places also. But it resulted in more unemployment, more inequality. That's why you must have read in newspapers one, one by 99, 1% versus 99% when Obama was there and then subsequently the movement against inequality in uh, United States. You must also be familiar, I'm sure, Thomas Piketty's writings on capital, the age of capital and why inequality has become so ingrained in the process of economic growth in this modern world under globalization. Because globalization privileges high education, high skill, high finance, high consumption and these structurally are only available to a smaller section of people in poor countries and a little more bigger section in the developed countries, but in both sides they lose on employment. On India alone, I, I, we, many have written and on the jobless growth, I myself have written on this, on the jobless growth process that is taking place in India. Despite, then you can even wonder as students why with such high growth rate over 30 years time, you know, a trend rate of growth of 6% per annum for more than 30 years in India, we are still talking about high unemployment, women's uh, less lower participation in the labor force and a whole rate of issues. So this is what I dealt with in the book on interrogating inclusive growth. But interestingly, because a few countries and which were later christened as emerging economies by the World Bank and IMF, they did so well and the leader is China, Brazil, India, Turkey, Thailand, many other countries, shifted the economic power somewhat away from the Western countries. Traditionally, they used to be the leaders. It shifted slowly but steadily. And this has been documented by a very outstanding Indian economist, Deepak Nayar, who is a macroeconomist, in his book, Catch Up, Developing Countries in the World Economy. And he identified 14 countries which really made it good in the process of globalization in terms of output growth, if not employment. And he calls it the next 14. That means the, the, those countries which could come in the leadership level. And that's why I have included them, most of them, uh, because he leaves out Saudi Arabia for good reasons. But I think politically it is now becoming more important in the BRICS plus. So that's what I said. But if you want to know um, what is going on in the international economic decision making level and how the discontent about globalization really gave rise to the rise of right wing political parties like the Trump or the right wing parties in Hungary, now in Italy and other places where Usually earlier we thought this unemployment and other restlessness will cause a leftward shift like Bernie Sanders, which is there but not very worldwide. But the people in the north rich countries have now become anti-immigrant. They want an excuse. They are taking away our jobs. Whereas it is the corporations who have taken away their jobs and the policies of their governments. And how the discontent is now playing out is in the latest book of not latest, but recent book of uh, Joseph Stiglitz, Globalization and its Discontents Revisited. <coughs> so he is revisiting his earlier book, Anti-Globalization in the Era of Trump. That's the subtitle. It is pre-Ukraine. I'm sure there will be another book after Ukraine <coughs> because things are moving so fast. But then at least some of you might ask me, what does this shift away from West indicate quantitatively? Is it strong enough to withstand. So I tried some very simple measures, two or three I will show you. And this is measuring the world GDP in current US dollars for two points in time, 30 years ago and now, 1991 and 21. So in the West, as I defined here, the 33 countries, EU 27 plus 
United States, United Kingdom, Japan, Australia, the G7. All right. They accounted for 74%, three-fourths of the world output in 1991, the blue line. But now, in 2021, it has reduced to, their share reduced to 54% of the world total. It is still majority, major share, but not big enough to unilaterally impose your will. Because things are taking place in other parts. If I take only BRICS from 7%, 6.9, to 26%. So if I include the other emerging economies, the 11 countries that I identified, including Saudi Arabia and Iran, it will now account for about 34, 35%. So 35% is no small measure to provide, and, and by just 16 countries collective against the combined strength of the West. So there is a shift in world output, but not significant. But then you can say this is in current US dollars. You are being told also that the real measure is the purchasing power of the dollar, PPP, purchasing power parity. But I must also tell you that purchasing power parity really represents the command over goods and services within each country. So what does it mean is that you take, there is a huge international comparative project on prices and United Nations have pitched in because they need to make these estimates in PPP dollars where you take a basket of goods consumed by most countries, people in the most countries and say this basket of goods, how much it will cost in the United States. Let's take the basket costs hundred dollars per day, okay. And then say for the same basket of goods, you come to India and say, and you pay in rupees, and how much will it cost? When they do that, they think that the amount of rupees given to for the same commodity, same basket, is only around thirty dollars equivalent. So every official dollar of the United States is three times worth in commodities and services in India. But in the official exchange rate, it doesn't uh, reflect. That's why countries' GDPs, when comparing each other, they revalue in PPP dollars. If you take the PPP dollars, it's very interesting that the share of the West goes down to 41%. And the share of the rest, that means the BRICS 5 plus 11, goes, to, goes up to 45%. And the rest is for the other countries, which is a very significant one. So that means for the same amount of money in these developing countries, you can command more resources. And which we know, if you have to, if you go to New York and you want to have a coffee, or even Geneva where I, and, and I, every time I go, go for a coffee in the railway station, I used to think, oh, three francs, three dollars. If you value that now, it's about 240 rupees. You can get maybe five, five best coffee here. So if only coffee is the only consumption, it is five times cheaper here. So that's the kind of uh, thing. So it doesn't matter whether the United States is spending, let's say, hundred billion dollars in the for their military. If we have thirty billion dollars, we can get the same kind of. So the real power reflect, is reflected in the PPP valuation, although it, is not, although it is not an exchange rate in the official exchange rate. So you have to take the official exchange rate for actual payments, but when you import something, you pay a dollar by 80 rupees. So basically you are transferring three times the resources here to the other country. That's the disadvantage of having a disparity between the official dollar and the PPP dollar. But you come to another important in the indicator of this power equation because people also matter. So if you take population share, the West is only now 13% of the global population. Out of every 100 people, only 13 people are there in the West. In the BRICS, it is just BRICS alone, five countries alone, 41%. These five countries and you know China and India together 
plus the other 3, 41%. But if you include the other 11, it will be 53%. So majority of the population is represented by these 16 countries, BRICS plus countries. And you cannot just dismiss this power of the people, although they may be poor. You can attack Iraq or you can attack, isolate Afghanistan, but you can't easily attack Indonesia, China or India. That will be beyond, they can't swallow it, you know. It's too, too big to manage. Area share, the West accounts for just less than one quarter of the world's land area, 23%, whereas BRICS alone around 30%, and if you take BRICS, BRICS plus, it's about 40%. And it's very interesting that the BRICS area, three countries, Russia, China, and India, in one block, is contiguous, which is also a tough challenge for an enemy. If you stand together, that's a big if. If you stand together, it's very difficult to uh, confront you. But then more mundane things with the day-to-day -day things, if you exports, if you take, 64% of the exports were by the Western countries, now down to 50%, half. Which means, of course, the remaining, the rest is, BRICS plus is only 29%. The rest is by other smaller countries. But the fact that the 50% is beyond the West is also an important shift of... So I'm not really talking about just the political and the feeling of, uh, you know, you are different and you are now in the 70s and 80s when the countries demanded for a new international economic order, this was not a statistic. So they couldn't back up their demand with real economic clout. But now you can cut off from a theoretical point of view. If you get cut off from the West, you will not starve. You can, you can produce most of the things that are produced there, except perhaps bombs. So that's the... That's the value of diversification in countries like India, China, Russia. That's how they are also, you know, despite some sanctions, they can uh, survive. Imports also. Imports is little more uh, accounted for by the West because they import a lot more. Their currency is strong. So what I would like to say is, unlike in the past, the current situation is characterized by a clear shift of economic weight or power in favor of the leading countries in the global south, BRICS plus. This is a historic shift during the last 200 years. It never happened during the last 200 years in the modern world. We were colonies subjected. So politically also you were subjected. After the world war, within the span of, uh, let's say, 70 years, this, this shift has occurred. So in historical time, it's a fantastic achievement. There are reasons to believe that this process will continue short of a massive exogenous shock. If, as we say in economics, other things remaining the same, then this situation will continue. But if there is a third world war, I hope there will not be, but you can't rule out, then the situation will be different. It will be much more uh, uh, calamitous for most countries, not just uh, the global south, or a pandemic. Just look at the experience during COVID. You just can't move out of your house. And even within your house, if you get COVID, you can't see other members of your house. How powerful nature is without any bomb, without any arsenal. It just made all of you stop, all of us stop. The entire world came to almost a stop. That's why now they talk about supply chain disruptions. What it means is that there is nobody to work, produce things in China and ship it to the port and then the ships to come and people to receive, there is no, no contact. So it also gives a very interesting dimension. The nature is saying that just don't get too excited by globalization, that everything can be, you know, by through exchange. You must have some self-reliance to look after your bad days. So countries like India, China did not suffer much because they are large and diversified. Country, unfortunately, countries like uh, Sri Lanka, many Latin American countries, smaller countries suffered because many of their things had to come from outside. They can't produce everything that they wanted. And that's how the impact is now seen in their inability to pay back the money because whatever 
reserve they had, they had to pay it for the higher prices of oil and other things. So they didn't have enough reserve in that sense. In the international finance, why dollar is still dominant is evident from this table. Although we have seen that in terms of export and imports, even American share is lower than the West as a whole. But you will see that countries hold dollars, although the share has come down from 85% of the total reserves of each country, this is global estimate, 85% in 1970 was in the form of US dollars. It went down very drastically to 47 by 1990 because of Soviet Union and other, other countries at that time. But once it collapsed, again it rose. But it went down, now it's just 59%. 59% is significant, but it is lower than 75% in the 1970s. Euro <coughs> took off very well, but it lost its speed. It's only 20% of the world reserves are kept in Euro. You, know, you, you need another lecture on the Euro. Because although Euro is a currency of, um, say, 17 countries within the European Union, Euro area, not everybody is, has accepted it. As an economist, you will find that you cannot really sustain a currency without a country. A country means you are, have a unified system of banking where you have a central bank. You have single monetary policy, you have a single fiscal policy. But their currency is more for trade and commerce and for people to transact. That avoids commissions and all kinds of complicated accounting. But when a Greece is in trouble, the others are not helping. But in India, China, Australia or United States or federations, if one state is in trouble, it's not their problem, it's a national government's problem as far as external payments are concerned, isn't it? So it is internally absorbed, but the German banks and the French banks did not come and bail out the Greek and they got very upset with that. Unlike the English, they can't come out of it because they are too weak. They still want the, the free money that is distributed among the countries of the Europe. There's a common fund. Same thing with Ireland, uh, Portugal. So they're all murmuring. That is also you find the Euro bonds are denominated by their countries. So that the German bond, they can sell easily for 2% yield, 2% interest. But if Greek issues a bond, they have to pay 8% because their credibility is low. So in a way, that's why people are not holding too much of uh, euro. Even this 20%, I guess, is due to the member countries' reserves and not to other countries. But what is interesting is, for the first time, Chinese renminbi has made an entry and now almost 3% of the global reserves are in Chinese renminbi, which means a lot of countries are storing renminbi, the yuan, as another form of foreign exchange reserves along with dollar and other things. So there is a big demand now to move out of dollar, moving away from dollar but a single non-dollar international currency is yet to emerge, which is very difficult. And the ideal solution should be an independent global reserve currency as recommended by the UN Commission of Experts. After the 2008 great financial crisis that started with the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank, uh, Goldman Sachs and others, which spread to Europe in no time because the banking systems of those countries are integrated, and currency trade is very common. That means you can hold a dollar and get a and put it in the bonds and get an interest. But if the UK pound is giving a higher interest, you can just transfer your money to pound and get that. But we were both China, India, we were very reluctant to integrate our banking system in terms of currency trade and convertibility. This is called the free convertibility of your currency. Since that was not there and we are still cautious, why, why we are cautious? The Chinese are also cautious. Despite Chinese you know, renminbi is being accepted as a reserve currency, it's still not a freely convertible currency for the Chinese. Because they, they want to be very cautious. They don't want, if there's a run on their uh, currency, 
like Indonesia did it very unwisely earlier. And during Suharto's period, Asian financial crisis, the, the Indonesian rupiah lost more than 80% of its value. Oh, not 80, maybe 40% or some of its value, which is an enormous risk. So there is already a report which after the 2008 financial crisis, the Western countries realized that they cannot carry on with the business as usual and therefore agreed to the demands because that's the time when G7, they said, let's not discuss everything in G7, let's go to G20 by expanding G7. So it's basically again a creation of the G7 by inviting important economies including Russia and they had to. At that time there was no tension. Uh, this is before the Crimean takeover. But it's a very uneasy coexistence in the G20. Ten, ten rich countries and ten not so, non Western countries. Ten Western countries and ten non Western countries. But for the first time, they agreed the demand of the developing countries that there should be a reform of the international monetary system, both in IMF and the World Bank. They also agreed that it may not be a very good idea to continue with the dollar as a reserve currency because dollar is a national currency. If a national currency also becomes an international currency, the demand for international transactions will have to be met by the Reserve Bank, the Federal Reserve System of the United States. That means they have to have run deficits on their current account so that they can release more money. But it also becomes easy for them because all these reserves are held in US Treasury bonds. It goes back to them, they'll give an interest. Instead of keeping our Reserve Bank of India, keeping all the dollars to itself, it will put it into the reserve, um, Federal Reserve so that it will get a rate of interest. Just like you have so much money, but you don't keep everything in currency. So you put it in the bank, so your money is safe, plus you get an interest. So it's the same way. But then, in this case, the US has to run a deficit. They have to keep on supplying the uh, dollar. But when it comes back to them in the form of treasury bonds, they can also spend it uh, in a profligate manner. And that's how they financed Vietnam War and Afghan War. So basically the rest of the world also paid indirectly for these war efforts because their currency was international currency. So that's a danger. It's an advantage for America but a danger for the rest of the world. But it can also become a problem for the United States because if suddenly some countries unload their uh, dollar reserves and say, no, we don't want any more, it will flush the inter US uh, monetary system and will create inflation because excess money coming back and it will disequilibrate their economy. So that they realized during the financial crisis and agreed for some reform of the international financial system. But the real forum for discussing all these things should be the United Nations. Not G7, G20. These are informal groups of powerful people. United Nations is the democratic forum where the General Assembly has all the countries in the world represented, like a parliament. So that parliament passed a resolution that we must have a single global reserve currency, unattached to any one country, and we need to work it out. So they invited Joseph Stiglitz to be the chairman with very important members from different countries, both developing and developed. India was represented by the former, very distinguished governor of the Reserve Bank, Y.V. Reddy. And they worked out in this report, if you read the report, if you are interested in the international economics, you should read this report. Very fine report, but written in a non-technical manner um, and submitted to the President of the General Assembly. But the rich countries didn't want to discuss that. Basically, America opposed it because that will be the end of the dollar being uh, used as a reserve currency, which they may not be ready for, because their dominance will go. Now, I'll give you one example. The India does its international trade, export and import, and prices all these goods and services in terms of dollars for 85% of its goods. But if your trade is only with the United States, it's only 5%. You need only that much dollars. But even if you are selling things to Bangladesh or buying from Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, you denominate in dollars. And they have to pay dollars, you have to give dollars. Which means both countries have to hold dollars as a reserve. 
that could have been avoided by an international currency unattached to a dollar system. If you are also familiar with the Keynesian economics and some history of the international monetary system, after the Second World War, this is exactly what Keynes proposed in the Bretton Woods Conference. And he called it banker, the new currency, where everybody, every country will subscribe, you will have a common fund, and then that will be allocated to member countries on a scientific criteria depending on your um, share of output and or whatever other criteria. And it will be cleared by a clearing union. Just like within our country, Reserve Bank of India acts as a clearing agent for many transactions. And the Reserve Bank of India is charged with printing money, circulating money, controlling it exactly in the same manner. So you can increase the volume of money, the volume of trade and volume of economic activity increases. So it will be an independent authority. The Americans didn't want because they were then the very most powerful. So there, but that's why much of economics is also driven by politics and other way around also. We just cannot separate, although in your classical economics you are being taught that it's all by the forces of supply, demand and the equilibrium conditions and all that nonsense uh, that you hear. So I would recommend this uh, for you. What are the India's opportunities? 